Um, well, I've always been interested in flight. This is from uh, 12 years ago, but uh, oh boy. Uh, I love seeing the red arrows. I'm sure a number of you do, and you enjoy going to air displays. My wife just suffers it, but uh, she lets me enjoy it. And I love flights. And I, I must admit that, that was the red arrows, the last one, of course. This is the F-18s of the Blue Angels uh, in America, in California. And I had the privilege of seeing them do their display in 2015. And boy, it was something really special. I'll play you a clip. Well, that, of course, is very, very fast indeed. We're not considering natural flight getting to that speed. But just, I, I show this because of the control. I'm just doing it backwards so you can see it. Just this incredible control as the first aircraft that I was following did, um, did a, a clockwise roll. And the, the other one was also doing a clockwise roll just at the last moment to avoid the collision. As I said, that is called the knife edge pass. There have been accidents with uh, aircraft doing that. It's incredible to watch. Now, worth going to be thinking about the natural world, but of course we have to go back uh, for modern uh, aircraft flights we have to go back to these people, and of course, you know who they are. These are the Wright brothers, but there is a connection with natural flight, which I'll bring out just in a moment, because these two guys, as they went to work in their bowler hats, which is what they did in those days, were just very ordinary people. They were actually, I can't do an interaction with the audience here, but most of you know that they were in fact bicycle makers and they were from Dayton, Ohio, and they did all their work in North Carolina at Kitty Hawk on a very windy day, December the 17th, 1903. Their work came to a conclusion, well, to a start really, but this was a magnificent conclusion to, their, to all this lead up as Orville, right, not Wilbur, was lying on the aircraft as you can see there, and uh, <clears throat> Wilbur was running around, running down the side on the right hand side there and they did a controlled flight with a powered aircraft the tail you can see behind but what uh, the vertical fin rather you can see behind but what probably you don't realize is that the horizontal second surface was at the front so if you look at the top right picture that's an earlier version without um Without propellers, it wasn't powered, it was a glider, but you could see the horizontal surface at the front. Where did Wilbur, who was the real mind behind this, get his ideas? Well, he got his ideas by following what the birds were doing. Instead of this guy who obviously jumped to his death and people in the past just thought it was a matter of adding feathers in. And these guys, of course, were cheating because they were uh, it was the French, actually, which is a bit naughty of me to say that. They weren't cheating. It's just that they were using a different principle of lighter than air flight. We're talking about heavier than air flight, so uh, something which would naturally um, always stay on the ground unless it was powered. And this, this powered flight was first done really in a controlled environment by the Wright brothers. They copied and this is the important bit. Wilbur copied and understood what birds were doing. So when it came finally to years later, this is actually a uh, hundred years later after that first flight in December uh, 1903. This is November 2003. This is the last flight of Concorde. And as you know, uh, a number of people were involved in developing Concorde and famously Barnes Wallace uh, was involved. 
uh, in the early design stage of Concord. And when you look at Concord, actually, when people saw its design, they thought, well, this looks more like a bird in some ways. And there is actually uh, uh, so many lessons that you can learn from bird flight. And Wilbur was looking at the birds, making actually aerofoil shapes and understanding the way the birds work. So when you consider the red arrows, the red arrows and the F-18s that I showed you earlier with the Blue Angels, all these advances in man-made flight have come from understanding natural flight. This is uh, a precursor to Concord. This, of course, was the Avro Vulcan. It was, for a long while, the only remaining flying Vulcan. They've all been grounded now, including this one. This was, uh, I took this at Farnborough 12 years ago, magnificent machine. But again, copying many of the principles which we learn from the birds. So I'm not gonna be able to do a huge amount in this talk. I'm going to actually look at five things, but uh, we'll maybe be able to squeak in a sixth. We'll see how we get on. But birds, of course, use feathers for their flight. Uh, this red-tailed hawk that you can see on the right epitomizes that. And uh, we're going to look at feathers, we're going to look at control of flight, we're going to look at hovering, a little bit on bone and muscle structure, and then a bit on breathing. We'll see how we get on with this. Feathers come in all shapes and sizes. I've got a feather here, which I will show you on the screen. I'll put it in front of my camera. And feathers are simply amazing structures. This is the flight feather from a buzzard, which I'm going to show you here. And feathers, this has seen better days actually, but uh, it's a beautiful um, structure in its own right, which I will talk about a bit more uh, in, a, in a few minutes. But let me just get this point over first concerning feathers. Feathers come in all shapes and sizes. As I said to you, this is a flight feather from uh, a buzzard, in fact. Now, I can't point to my screen easily, so uh, forgive me, I've lost my cursor and I was trying to sort that out earlier. But if you look at the arrows on this picture, you can see the primary feathers that I've just referred to are on the outer edge. If you want to train your budrigar or train your pet bird, you cut off those primary feathers. Seems a bit cruel, but it, but it isn't. They grow again, the bird can't feel any pain. And indeed, birds replace their feathers each year. Uh, anyway, you've got primary feathers, which are very asymmetric. Then you've got secondary feathers as you come further in. And then you've got tertiary feathers. These are all really at the back of the wing. Um, then as you come closer to the front of the wing, you've got covert feathers, or we could call them covering feathers, because that's really the sense of that word, covert. And you've got primary, greater, and lesser coverts and median coverts. And then you could actually say that you've got uh, further uh, covering feathers, even as you come forward again. And these feathers are all individual. No feather is exactly the same as its neighbor. Then, as I've shown, you've got retrices, which are the feathers on the tail, and those are much more symmetric. They're symmetric in the middle, but they actually do get slightly asymmetric to the side of the tail. So their location is extremely important. A bird can have easily 500 feathers for small birds. In fact, it runs into usually two or three thousand feathers and it, in one sense it doesn't really depend on the bird size it just means that everything shrinks for a tiny little hummingbird um, and it, everything gets bigger of course for the big birds of prey which I'll show you in a moment. Now if you're going to get lift I, I like to say if I've got an audience uh, actually with me that uh, you know, this looks a little bit like getting serious stuff. Well, it is serious stuff. 
if I was really being naughty, I could say there's going to be a test at the end and some interpreter is going to mark it for me. But if I was teaching, as I did for many years at the University of Leeds, the aerodynamics course, I was teaching pilots to understand how they, um, how their own planes worked. Half of them didn't really understand. They knew about computers, but they didn't know about aerodynamics. Well, you really do need to know about aerodynamics if you're in an emergency situation. And an aerofoil, which you can see is that red shape there, has flow going over it. And it's the turning of the flow which gives you lift. You can turn the flow by anything you like. If it was magnetized flow in some way with ions, charged particles, you get a great big magnet around it, you could turn the flow. And there would be a, a reaction to that turning. So really, lift is, the, is due to the fact that you're turning the flow in some way, the actual, what we call the free stream flow. And when you turn that flow, there is a, a net force on the object which is doing the turning, which is the aerofoil. That's actually uh, forces and reaction to forces, which Newton talked about. Now, of course, it's metal usually was wood in the past. Sometimes you still get wooden planes. But today, of course, uh, aircraft have very sophisticated shapes which are developed on computers. But for birds, how do they make that aerofoil shape? Which they do, by the way, they do it with feathers. And there's usually a lot more feathers, as I was talking about covering feathers near the front, and then a lot less feathers down to one feather on the edge as you're looking sideways on the wing. And it's amazing that birds have shapes just like that. Uh, Colin Mitchell and myself, Colin, I think is listening tonight. Uh, he introduced me to um, the Isle of Mull where they got, they reintroduced there and they've reintroduced them elsewhere as well now. The famous white-tailed eagle, which is a magnificent bird stretching more than two meters wide with its wingspan and a, a magnificent flyer. And if you look carefully on the wings, you can see the he heavily curved leading edge of the wing. Here's another picture of, of it as it's doing a, a turn. You can see the aerofoil shape at the front. Colin Mitchell himself has taken some pictures, this time not of a white-tailed eagle, he's taken those as well. This is a red kite and this is from a farm where they feed them in Wales and uh, he took this a few years ago. This is a magnificent picture again of a red kite on a turn and you can see the aerodynamics of the leading edge, which is what I'm referring to. Please note the flight feathers on the edges, which are down, as I said, to single feathers by the time you get to the extremities of the wing, particularly at the back, you're down to single feathers, covering feathers as you come forward from the back. So a wing is a magnific magnificent structure. Here's another picture of the, uh, a red kite at the same location. Uh, in a dive for the food that as they feed them on, they usually feed um, by coming, swooping down to the ground and picking up the prey. They are, of course, wonderful birds of prey. So did these birds that I've just been describing emerge from reptiles? That's a lizard from Africa. I had a wonderful chance to take this picture some years ago. And we are really taught that birds emerge from reptiles. I really just do not accept it. And I want to show you why. Because feathers are made from a very different structure to the scales on a reptile skin, such as we know uh, dinosaurs had. We've actually got impressions of dinosaur scales on uh, on fossils that we have of dinosaurs. So we know that their scales were very similar to crocodile scales. And the way those scales work is a very different to the way that feathers work on a bird. 
they're both made of keratin, that's true, just like the fingernails that you have or the hair that I used to have on my head. Um, I still do the semblance of a parting every morning, but believe you me, I'm losing it all. So keratin is a, a substance which is often used in living cells and to give a hard structure. But we need to realize that the feather that I showed you earlier of a buzzard, which I'm holding now, has a structure to it and it grows from a rachis, which is this main central stem, which comes to a follicle underneath the skin. And this idea of this Japanese gentleman, that the structure is very similar to a reptilian scale, is totally wrong. Because the feather grows, as I indicated, from a collar in the sheath and the follicle rather, and the feather sheath grows inside that follicle. That itself is an amazing structure. There is this growth color and the feather grows inside it as I've shown on this schematic diagram. And this is a, a quickened up video to show you what happens in the follicle, which is attached under the skin for a bird, just like your hairs are attached uh, under the skin of, of our bodies. So these feather follicles have not hairs, but a feather sheath growing inside. So it grows inside with these barbs, which then spread out from the sheath, which uh, is holding the feather inside the follicle. And this is uh, this shows you the transparent, uh, as you can see there, the shiny reflection as uh, my wife is holding actually a young pigeon's wing. And you can see the shiny tube is the sheath in which the feather had grown out of the follicle. And <clears throat> the best way that I can help you understand what's going on. It's a bit like a big pen, which I'm holding in front of the camera here. And obviously, normally you've got that pen inside. So if you take that out and I get another feather, which I've got here, and I put it inside, then you'll get something of an idea as to what is going on with a feather in its sheath which itself is in the follicle, right? So what you're seeing on the screen there on that picture is similar to what I'm now holding. It's a sort of little model, if you like, of the feather growing on the bird. And this is an amazing system. This is a big pen holder, and this is very thick compared with what you actually see on the bird but the feather has a very, very thin layer of keratin, which quickly will crumble away as the feather has grown out of the sheath. Now, this is a marvelous system because all these feathers, remember, they're all different. And if you didn't have this sheath, then they would just simply get involved in one another and as they're growing outwards would actually uh, disturb their gr the growth of the adjacent feather. So this little holder, this sheath, is very, very important. Now that's nothing like a reptilian scale. Let, let me tell you something else about feathers. I really get wound up when people try to tell me that scales and feathers are similar. No, they're not. When you put a feather like this one under the microscope, you actually see something extraordinary. Look at this feather that I'm holding now. This, as I separate the feather barbs, you can see, if you look very closely, that there is a lot of furriness on either side of the divide. And if I put my hand over it, I can actually join up those barbs. I can separate it there and I can join up the barbs. That is wonderful. That's extraordinary. Um, so 
um, this is an amazing system uh, because what I'm showing you on the screen here is how it works. You can see the individual barbs, which are the black lines on the diagram below the pigeon's secondary feather picture. And you can see that there is a, um, a vertical barbule, which is coming off from the barb. You can also see a horizontal barbule and you'll see that the vertical ones come over the, the, the horizontal ones. And if you look at the right hand side of that picture, you will see that there is a diagram which you perhaps can't uh, make out straight away. But if you see the, the, the right hand picture, it's got hooks on and the left hand part of that right hand overall picture has got little ridges and it's a bit like a curtain rail the ridges slide over the curtain rail so the barbs adjacent barbs are held together by this mechanism which is why when i run my finger over this separated barb set of two adjacent barbs actually you can make them come back together again. It's a bit like Velcro, all because of this amazing system. A feather is an amazing example of lightweight engineering. There's a picture of the actual system, which you can see David Menton took this picture years ago. And uh, you can see the hooks sliding over the ridges. So for this sliding joint, you've got to have a place where you have oil to provide it for the bird and the oil for the bird is at the preening gland at the back of the bird, which means that the bird's got to have the ability to turn its head 180 degrees in order to get at the gland at the back. So in order to spread that oil over those feathers. These are all necessary for feathers. Now, I don't accept these dates here, but apparently, um, this amber, which is hardened resin from a tree, people argue holds a 99 million year old flight feather. But you can still see the hook and barbule, hook and ridge structure of the barbules, which are in between the barbs, even through the amber, which has trapped that feather. So feathers have always been feathers. Here, Richard Dawkins, who tried to tell us something about the way feathers emerged. The biologist Richard Dawkins has written a great length about genetics and has committed much of his academic career to answering the questions that arise. Oh. Something has to explain the novelties themselves. Yeah. Well, the novelties themselves, of course, are genetic variations in the gene pool, which ultimately come from mutation and more proximately come from sexual recombination. There's nothing very inventive or ingenious about those novelties. I mean, they are random mm. and uh, they mostly are um, deleterious. Most, most mutations are bad. And so you really need to focus on natural selection as the, as the positive side. And it's only natural selection that produces uh, living things which have the, the illusion of design. The, the illusion of design does not come from the novelty. What was it? about that early novelty before it culminated in something as useful as a feather where could natural selection get its purchase upon yes. something which was uh, no more than a pimple there cannot have been intermediate stages which were not beneficial it's there's there's no room in natural selection for the sort of um foresight argument that says well if we go to persist for the next million years and it'll start becoming useful uh, that doesn't work there's got to be a selection pressure all the way so there isn't a process as we're going on in the cells saying look be patient no it, it's going to be a feather believe me <laughs> yes it, do, it doesn't happen like that uh, there's got to be a series of advantages all the way in in the feather if you can't think of one then that's your problem not uh, not natural selection's problem, natural selection, um, uh, well, I suppose that is a sort of matter of faith on my, on my mm. part, since the theory is so coherent and so, and so powerful. So he was digging himself a hole, 
he was actually realizing that he didn't actually have an answer as to why the original idea of a pimple, as he, as Jonathan Miller was trying to ask him, uh, how that became a feather. And so he says, it's a matter of faith on my part. His faith is not the same as our faith based on evidence. His faith is based really on no evidence whatsoever. We would call it blind faith. That's a classic clip showing how Dawkins has no answer as to where this feather mechanism came from. So you see, We've just seen that modern feathers, and in the first case, it was a 99 million year old supposedly feather. We don't accept the dates, but feathers have always been feathers. And, you know, people have argued about Cretaceous fossils, um, uh, which show all evidence of some ancient bird. They, of course, would try to tell you that it's many millions of years ago. In this case, it's meant to be 127 million years ago. And yet, it shows all evidence from the feather impressions that it really was a genuine flyer, not a half bird. And yet it's supposed to be 127 million years old. It's not exactly like the birds we have today, but it is easily recognizable as a bird. So even though I don't accept the dates on this slide, please don't think that I do. What this shows is that feathers have remained the same. And the fossil that I've just shown you, the first one was supposedly 99 million years old. That was in the first bit of resin. Then the next one is supposedly something around 27 million years old. Then this so-called Cretaceous fossil of what looks distinctly like a bird is something in the region of 127 million years old in their reckoning. Actually, they're all flood deposits in my understanding. But what this shows to you is that this idea that there has been a gradual progression, and I'm referring here particularly to the Chinese fossils, right? It's not really a progression at all of flight because the one that I've just shown you is right in the middle and Archaeopteryx, which is meant to be very, very old, actually, even that had fully formed feathers. So my view, and I don't agree totally with all my creation colleagues here, my view is that these, including Archaeopteryx, and the ones which clearly have flight feathers, and some of those Chinese fossils don't really have flying, um, flying abilities. Some of them do but not all of them do. Uh, Codipteryx probably was indeed uh, a flying creature, but it's not clear that Sinosauropteryx really was. Microraptor gui possibly, well, in fact, I think certainly was a flying creature. But what I'm trying to get at here is that everything indicates that these were unusual, but nevertheless, birds. And people, of course, uh, were astonished when at one point in their investigations, they found bird tracks in rock, which was supposedly somewhere around 200 million years old. Do you know what they did? They reclassified that and said, well, it can't be Triassic rock. And they then uh, thought that it must be tertiary rock and they reclassified it. Now, they may be right on the reclassification, but actually I would have no problem if in fact we did find real bird tracks in the Triassic. So my view is that these, uh, these Chinese fossils in particular, where they clearly were flying creatures, were just simply extinct birds that we don't have today. I need to speak on control. Flight needs control. It's no use having all the individual parts when in fact you need to have a control system to make sure that these actually operate together. We call this irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity. That means that you cannot reduce it to just simple little stages and that, you know, if I add a bit here, I can gradually move up the ladder of flight. No, you're not going to do it. If you can have anything which flies, 
You need not just one surface, Wilbur Wright and Orville Wright found this, you need two surfaces. That is, you need the tail plane, which for them they had at the front. You need two surfaces. Irreducible complexity was something that they understood and others understood after them from those early days in the 1900s, people realized that in order for flight to work, you needed control surfaces, as well as those two layers, two wings, um, the main wings and also the tail plane, you needed control surfaces on both sets of wings, the main wings and the tail plane. Today, we often have tail planes which move completely but sometimes you have little surfaces at the back of the tail plane. So you need forward flaps, back flaps, you need slats, you need ailerons, which are the way that you roll the, the aircraft and we'll, we'll mention winglets as well. This is a lovely picture of hooded cranes in flight where they have, they clearly show the cambered surface they have the winglets at the end, which I'll mention a bit later, and a smooth undercarriage under retraction. I rather like this because you can see the feet going backwards with a real streamlined effect. Design is vital for any engineering that we do today. Birds show all the evidence of intricate design, cambering of the wing is absolutely essential at low speed for takeoff and landing. And a bird doesn't have screws operating the flaps at the back of the wings. As you well know, there is a whole set of tendons and uh, muscles which change the shape of those wings. My friend Robert Buckley, Bob Buckley from my own church here in Milnrow, took these wonderful pictures of gannets in St Kilda in Scotland. And you can see here that these birds are designed for what they do. And I'm gonna show you. Bob took some further pictures of these birds doing pencil dives. That is, they fly along at uh, about two or 300 feet. They have wonderful eyesight. They see fish in the water. They draw their wings together and they come down into a, a knife dive or a pencil dive where they become like a pencil. Look at this picture on the left and you'll see that the gannet has brought its wings right in and it can go straight into the water. This is a brilliant set of photos uh, taken by Bob Bulky, but Buckley at St Kilda. My friend um, Colin Mitchell not so long ago, um, took this picture at Portland Bill of a peregrine falcon, which is the real expert in what we call stoops. They dive at 200 miles an hour and they have a special transparent eye cover because they're traveling so fast, their eye would water too much and they wouldn't be able to see. So they have this sideways surface as well. Um, the ones which really have the speed record, though, for level flight are swifts, which even flying upwards can reach speeds of 70, nearly 70 miles an hour. Again, this is a picture by Colin Mitchell. But so that's dealing with speed. As I was referring to speed, I thought I'd just put those in with those gannets. Uh, but now let me just come to some detail about those forward flaps. You can see on this wonderful picture of a grey heron taken by Peter Kavanagh, you can see at the front there of the wing, you can see a surface coming up, not at the end of the wing, but halfway along the leading edge. You can see what is actually called the Alula feathers. Sometimes it's two or three, it can be as many as seven feathers connected to the thumb in the structure of the um, uh, uh, bird structure um, of the, uh, the bones, obviously, which are supporting the wing. And these are absolutely essential for low speed flight. The tail is essential, the curved aerofoil shape is essential, but also, as you've seen from my earlier picture of this white-tailed eagle, 
there are winglets at the edge, which are also important for reducing drag. In fact, this idea was copied by airliners about 30 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, and they've now put them on uh, the, the ends of the wings in order to reduce the trailing vortex, which creates drag as a result of lift at low speed. And this was a picture I took uh, from of a Lufthansa Airbus A320 with those winglets for reducing drag. And of course, birds have had this for many years, but it took us a long while to catch up with what the birds have. These Alula feathers that I mentioned are shown again here on this male American kestrel. And you can see here that these are very similar to the slats or the forward um, flats, sometimes called on an Airbus A310. You remember that there was a problem, and indeed there still is a problem, with the Boeing 737 MAX. There's been two fatal accidents. And the problem is that they have a computer system which was not operating properly, which was getting a signal which was in error from an angle of attack sensor at the front of the aeroplane. This really stresses the importance of having control. And the control system of the Boeing 737 MAX was not sufficiently developed such that it was fail safe that if you got one signal wrong, it would insist on actually putting the nose up when in fact the pilot wanted to put the nose down. And as a result of that, sorry, it's the other way around. I said it incorrectly. The pilot needs to have the nose up in actual uh, uh, takeoff. And because the indication from the angle of attack sensor, which you can see on the bottom right picture there, was, was coming, the incorrect signal, it was automatically pushing the nose down and the pilot was trying to bring the nose up, but the automated system was doing things incorrectly. And so you got a conflict between what the pilot knew he needed and what the computer was doing. This shows that unless a system is working with all the bits working together, you will get fatal accidents. Interacting systems need control. You can see here an aircraft on the left, which is not doing things very well. And the bird on the right, which is an albatross, does far better in order to collect squid. This, this albatross, which I've got uh, the film going on at the same time, that albatross was actually working far better with its systems of control than the aircraft on the left, which is not a Boeing 737 MAX, but um, shows the difficulties that you get when things are out of control. God has made creatures with a wide range of control. There are also anti-stall devices, which I could do a whole talk on, which cause the feathers at the back of the wing to lift in order deliberately to stop what we call the stall point going right across the wing and then the bird would just fall out of the sky. So there are some amazing systems which are working quite naturally in birds in order to avoid the bird from stalling at low speed. Well, birds are, have a remarkable striking appearance, particularly when we can get fast photography on them as Colin Mitchell again showed here with this Kingfisher. And I just think it illustrates wonderfully the control that birds have quite naturally. They're able to change their wing shape with ease. Well, let me just briefly talk about hovering. Here's a hovering kestrel, which uh, it's a European kestrel, and it's showing the ability to hover 
Sometimes even in high winds, kestrels can hover. As a wind going at about 30 miles an hour, it can still stand stationary in the air because what it does is it flicks the ends of its wings and it's balancing against its tail. That's one way of hovering. But of course, the ones which we know well, far better, which do the hovering, are hummingbirds, like this uh, ruby-throated uh, um, hummingbird, which is shown here. It doesn't look ruby-throated, but actually it is. When you get the, color, the light on it, it's a beautiful bird. Now, these hummingbirds do their skilled aerodynamic displays by twisting their wings 180 degrees right back on themselves, such that if you looked at the tip of the wing, it is actually twisting its wing and it's twisting it at the elbow here. The wing actually at the wrist, the equivalent of the wrist on a bird, for a hummingbird, that wrist is hardly ever moved. And the whole surface is swiveling around the elbow and it has the ability to twist the radius and the ulna which is supporting the wing right over 180 degrees such that you can get a figure of eight motion as the hummingbird beats its wings 50 to 60 even 100 times per second and with very fast photography, you can actually see this twisting of the wings in this blue-throated uh, male hummingbird. The other thing, though, of course, about hummingbirds is that they feed in a very different way. They feed from nectar, just like insects, and they are beating their wings at 50 to 60 times per second in a hovering position, and then lapping up the nectar in uh, five to 10 times per second with their tongues going into the nectar and coming back again. Absolutely extraordinary. There's the hummingbird sticking out its tongue. Briefly on the bone and muscle structure, birds have a bone structure which is hollow. Most of the bones of birds are hollow, but there are some exceptions. Diving birds like puffins and uh, the birds called the northern diver, uh, the Americans or the Canadians would call them loons, uh, they have heavy bones, particularly at the back. Some of the bones will be hollow, but, but the ones particularly at the back, when they're diving into the water, they need to be able to be not too light to actually get under the water and fish. But most birds have hollow bones. Now, those hollow bones are supporting the structure of the wing. And I mentioned this earlier, that you have different types of feathers in different locations. But I particularly want you to look at the way that the wrist movement, which is the middle of the wing, is controlled by, you'll see it in a moment, I'll show you the tendon arrangement. Most of the movement of the wing is from the elbow. So you have the radius and the ulna here on the, uh, from the elbow to the wrist. Then the wrist on most birds is moving very, very well indeed. And that has extended fingers three main fingers usually on a bird wing, which the thumb supports the alula feathers and the other two digits spread to the outer wing feathers. So they're called phalanges. And then there are these other bones, as I mentioned, the radius and the ulna and the humerus. The humerus is usually quite short on a bird. Then you've got these tendons, and particularly look at this patagial tendon, which connects amazingly the shoulder to the wrist. We don't have that tendon. Neither do reptiles have that tendon. This is a completely new tendon, which is specific to a bird to control its wing. Remember I mentioned when a bird wants to 
make itself into a very uh, into a bullet coming down in a dive like a peregrine falcon well it will use this tendon to bring its wings in and we we saw that uh, with those other pictures that i showed you um, uh, as well of these diving birds well it's true for any bird it's got to have that patagial tendon but it's not only that that a bird's got to have. A bird's got to have another muscle, which is also peculiar to a bird. When a bird is actually flapping its wings, it's got to have a muscle to bring the wing down, but it's also got to have a muscle to bring the wing up again. We have a small muscle at the back, which enables us to do a backstroke in tennis. Well, you have to develop that muscle because it's not really a very strong muscle or in swimming if you're doing a backstroke. But a bird has a special muscle, which is called the pectoralis major, sorry, I beg your pardon. It has the pectoralis major muscle like all creatures and like human beings, which is for the motion downwards. But the motion going upwards is provided by another muscle, which is called the supracoracoideus muscle for the upstroke. And as you can see, it goes over the humerus, twists round, comes up from the sternum here, which is uh, the breastbone, and it pulls round and brings the humerus bone up for uh, when the wing is going up and then the, super, the pectoralis major muscle pulls the wing down. So you can see it operating here in this little video. There's the pectoralis major muscle pulling it down. Now the supracoracoideus muscle is pulling the wing up. That's a very useful little video clip here to show how bird muscles work. So you've got a downstroke muscle, which is the pectoralis major muscle, like the muscle you used the other day to punch your, uh, your friend. Uh, I hope you didn't, but you see what I'm saying, that you, you've got that muscle, which is a very strong muscle to pull down. But the bird has this extra muscle for pulling the wing up. Well, this is an amazing system and it's unique to birds to have that extra muscle. Well, what about breathing? Did you know that birds breathe in a totally different way? Birds breathe not by bringing the air to a dead stop in an inverted tree arrangement as is shown on the left for reptiles and mammals, but they breathe actually using what's called a counterflow mass exchange system. It is just possible, it is just possible, and there is some evidence beginning to show that some, uh, some uh, crocodiles possibly have um, a counterflow system. But even if that is proved to be the case, I'll show you why that isn't going to be, uh, uh, that that's not going to actually work for this idea that reptiles changed into birds or evolved into birds because you need something else as well. Birds certainly have this counterflow system. The air comes in on one side and the blood comes in the other way. And the counterflow system means that as the air is moving, it doesn't need to come to a dead stop. The oxygen goes into the bloodstream and the carbon dioxide comes out into the air, even as the blood and the air are still flowing together. We breathe like this. We breathe in, bring the air to a dead stop, goes into the bloodstream, we push out carbon dioxide and out it goes. But not so with the bird. The bird breathes in and it goes into an air sac. It doesn't immediately go to the lung. Then it breathes out an earlier packet of air, the packet of air that we're following goes through the lung, as I said, in this counter flow arrangement. Then the bird breathes in again, Another packet of air goes to the rear and the packet of air that we're following now goes to a front air sac, ready to be breathed out. Now the bird breathes out and that packet of air comes out. So it's a two stroke breathing system. It breathes in, goes to the back, breathes out, that packet of air goes through the lung, 
breathes in again, goes to a front air sac, breathes out and that air comes out. So it's a circulatory system. That is an incredible system. And to argue that this could have evolved from a system where you breathe in and out and it comes to a dead stop is frankly absurd. Because let me tell you something else. When we breathe in and out, and when even if crocodiles are found, or alligators, I think it was that they argued that alligators may have a counterflow system. Even if that were proven, we know that alligators and crocodiles, like we ourselves, have a diaphragm in order to operate our breathing system. But a bird does not have a diaphragm. This is the vital difference. You see, a bird doesn't use a diaphragm to bring the air pressure down in its, in, in, in its main body, which is, of course, what you've got to do. We have a diaphragm. It, it draws in the air. So the air's got to come in through our trachea, and that's how we breathe. And that's how most land creatures breathe. But birds don't breathe like that. They breathe by actually moving their breastbone. They have a movable sternum. And that, of course, is often in sympathy with the flapping of their wings. And as they move their sternum, their breastbone, they've got to have hinged ribs in order to take account of that. And that is an amazing system, which is unique to birds. Coming back to the fossils, you remember I mentioned this creature which was found and clearly was a bird. They found another bird. Clearly it was a bird because they could even find the lungs of the bird fossilized. And this was in a in rock which was uh, thought to be, by their reckoning, 120 million years old. I don't accept those dates for a moment. But even using their time scale, that supposedly 120 million year old fossil clearly had evidence of the lung system that I just referred to. And you could actually see the evidence of it in the fossil. And evidence from the paper that uh, I can send you the reference for if you need it, uh, they, they themselves could say where the stomach was, where the lungs were. And this lung system was clearly that of a bird. And it says in this quote from the National Geographic article, this primitive bird's lungs closely resemble those found in living birds. Well, you bet it does. The reason is that essentially it was a bird. And then it, of course, argues that this suggests that birds' hyper-efficient lungs, a key adaptation for flight, first emerged earlier than thought. Well, of course, that presupposes their dating system. Well, I've talked about breathing. Time just for a very quick additional point, which I might just be able to squeeze in. A sixth stunning design feature. I was on the island of St. Lucia not so long ago this year before the lockdown occurred. And you can see here a beautiful Antilles crested hummingbird, which is about the size of a wren, very small. And you could see it with its tongue out. You remember I mentioned this tongue earlier? Let me just show you what this beautiful little hummingbird and all hummingbirds do when they feed on nectar. I'm going to play you this clip, if I may, Simon, and I'll be ending on very shortly after this. The hummingbird's tongue is about twice as long as its beak, so it can reach deep into a flower. And until recently, many scientists believe that the birds relied heavily on capillary action to draw the nectar through their tongues and into their mouths. Kind of like water spontaneously rising up a thin straw in a glass. But some fascinating discoveries at the University of Connecticut have shown that the mechanisms involved are much more dynamic than anyone realized. Just follow this, guys. It really is interesting. 
The hummingbird's tongue is actually a nectar trap equipped with a pair of narrow tubes that taper sharply. The tip of each tube is segmented into a row of flaps that are attached to a supporting rod. When the bird isn't eating, these flaps form two rows of closed loops that fit compactly into the beak. But when the hummingbird feeds, its tongue undergoes a dramatic transformation. Inside the flower, the tongue extends to make contact with the nectar. When immersed in fluid, the tip splits and the flaps on each fork systematically unfurl. Then as the tongue is withdrawn, the flaps close tightly to seal and capture the nectar for delivery into the bird's mouth. This entire process is executed automatically in less than a 20th of a second, thousands of times a day. I think you will agree with me that that is just stunning. Did you know that a hummingbird has to get the weight? It has to feed such that it increases by its own weight every day because it uses so much energy flying around um, that it has to carry on feeding from dawn to sunset. They also have a special facility for actually going into torpor overnight. And they will actually go right down in temperature such that you'll even think that the bird is dead. The heartbeat slows right down. So it doesn't waste all that energy. This Antilles crested hummingbird actually shows real beauty as you can see on the left as it's got a shimmering effect on that crest. The green-throated carib was also in St Lucia and whatever creature you're looking at they have some amazing feather structures which sometimes particularly for hummingbirds are iridescent. A peacock feather has the iridescent colours. Did you know that a peacock feather the eye of the peacock feather actually has dimensions, as you can see that I've drawn lines on it here, such that this is the golden ratio. And that shape that is actually drawn there in black, which has a sort of a, a V on its side, that is what we call in mathematical terms, a cardioid. These are incredible shapes which are being made by a different structure emerging as the feather grows and the barb is growing through that uh, iridescent structure, which is formed not by pigment, but by changes in the surface level of the barb as it grows through that picture. I find that utterly stunning. And to suggest that you really must have a peacock eye in order for a peahen to be interested in a peacock is frankly pushing the very limits of absurdity. Because if you've ever seen a peahen and a peacock acting together, a peahen doesn't show a huge amount of interest in the actual eyes, these false eyes in the feathers it seems that there is an indication here that God has made all these things of beauty more for us to look at than for peahens in the case that we're considering. So whether we're considering a lesser spotted woodpecker, a red-throated hummingbird, or Wilson's uh, bird of paradise, 
whatever we're considering, and we come to the scriptures which say this, have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like him? Deck yourself now with majesty and excellency and array yourself with glory and beauty. The over design that exists, particularly in birds, is all to do with beauty, to demonstrate his glory. And may I remind you that the Bible actually says that fish and flying creatures were not made after the land creatures, but before the land creatures. So any suggestion that land creatures developed slowly in time and emerged with flight is frankly wrong, according to the Bible. God, I think, has deliberately shown us that he made the flying creatures, not by using anything from land creatures, but that he made them before, lest we might think in evolutionary terms. The Bible says the invisible things of God, him, are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. May I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, everybody who's listening, that the Bible doesn't give us any excuse not for believing in creation, not by appealing to the Bible directly, but by saying, look at the things that he has made, which therefore means that we should believe the Bible when it comes to talk about redemption, the fact that we are sinful, the fact that God must punish sin. And when it speaks in no uncertain terms about a judgment to come, that is why it says in Romans 1.20, they are without excuse. Nobody can come before God and say, I didn't know you were there. We know from the birds and from everything that he has made that he is. And we also know, therefore, that the Bible is true when it speaks about a judgment to come. And there is only one way of escape, and that is through the very creator himself, the one who made the birds, also laid down his life that we might be forgiven. And he died that we might know forgiveness because he took our punishment in our place. That is why this whole issue of creation is so important. We want people to trust the very book which speaks about creation, the Bible, when it speaks also of judgment to come and redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to him now, not only as your creator, but as your saviour, the one who bled and died, that you might be forgiven. Thank you.